here. I think uh, building on the three previous presentations, um, I'm going to go from the general to the particular and from the past to the present. So I'm going to, as Henry alluded, talk about the South Korean case and in particular pyroprocessing. Um, so as Frank explained, Reprocessing is one of two paths to creating the basalt material necessary to build nuclear weapons. Uh, more or less, since the Carter administration, uh, American policy has been to discourage the spread of both uranium enrichment and reprocessing technology, although we've done better or worse at that. I was a Republican, you need to change that. It's not um, okay. I mean, you know, it's, you can you can quibble about exactly when this started. Quibbling. President Kennedy was concerned about proliferation, but we know that at least as a matter of law, as we just heard, since the Carter administration, that has been been U.S. policy. There is a statement. We'll, we'll, you'll be inflicted with Mr. Kowalski at some point, and you'll never do that again. Um, so this policy uh, was tested. Uh, once again, uh, during the negotiations for renewing the U.S. ROK nuclear cooperation agreement, um, which was, the renewal was concluded in 2015. And the reason for that testing was Seoul's desire to preserve their ability to pursue a technology called pyroprocessing. It doesn't matter much uh, what the exact de physical details of it are. Um, it is, it was sold originally, and, and the technology dates, is now decades old, uh, but has never been implemented at a commercial scale. It was sold originally as being something that would be cheaper and more scalable than uh, aqueous reprocessing, the now more widely used technique, um, but uh, remained in abeyance, and right now, as I say, it hasn't yet been deployed. Um, so, the 2015 revision to the U.S. ROK Nuclear Cooperation Agreement provided for completion of a study that Frank alluded to um, on the, the feasibility and merits and demerits, at least uh, ostensibly, of pyroprocessing. Um, it allowed the ROK to continue limited experiments to advance the technology, and committed the sides in 2021 to discuss whether or not the results meant that um, the agreement should be revised on that basis to effectively permit um, hardware processing to go forward. In the meantime, surprisingly, <laughs> other elements of the U.S. government, uh, a national laboratory with receiving U.S. funding, uh, was promoting pyroprocessing. So this is the front of a pamphlet that they uh, have had put together on this in, I think, 2012. Um, Argonne National Lab. One of the cheerful uh, headlines within the pamphlet was they're turning uh, nuclear waste into wonder fuel. Of course, uh, that's all because of the virtues of pyroprocessing. And those that argued on behalf of pyroprocessing noted that it was possible to do it in a way that would mix in actinides, highly radioactive um, parts of the spent fuel, that would be inappropriate for turning into a weapon, or at least it would make it more difficult. Um, what they also didn't say, though, was that while it's possible to do that, it's also possible not to do that, which meant that if the people who own the pyroprocessing plant, the government, so decided, you effectively could use it for reprocessing to prevent, to uh, produce pure plutonium that would be appropriate for weapons. Um, Argonne not only put out a pamphlet, they hosted a conference. Uh, you could go to a resort in Wisconsin to discuss pyroprocessing. That may sound trivial, but I would note that there were 22 poster sessions, 50 presentations, over four days, dozens of attendees, and this was only one of several such conferences. So there were others in Dimitrovgrad, Russia, Idaho Falls, Idaho, and uh, Jeju Island in the Arab Tech. 
So even as the U.S. government was struggling to resist the ROK uh, interest in pyroprocessing, at least in Washington, <laughs> elsewhere, we were full steam ahead. Um, and I have more backstory about this related to when I was at the Department of Energy before that, um, but it's probably not worth going into at this point. The important point, though, is, and it's very difficult to actually find this statement in authoritative, authoritative USG documents, but I know it actually to exist uh, firsthand. Um, pyroprocessing is reprocessing. Uh, Dick Stratford, who is a longtime um, State Department official who works on these issues, was addressing the Carnegie Conference several years ago. And he quoted DOE as saying, frankly and positively, that pyroprocessing is reprocessing, period, full stop. So if, if you're thinking about whether or not we should allow pyroprocessing to go forward, you shouldn't think of it as being in any way different than um, conventional reprocessing. And I would note that DOE reached that conclusion during my time at the National Nuclear Security Administration. Um, and while this may seem like a relatively brief explication, there is analysis behind that that I think proves it to be true. So where does that leave us? Well. Frank actually alluded to many of the ROK arguments in favor of pyroprocessing, and he dispensed with some of them. I'm not sure if he got them all, so I'll go through them briefly. Limited storage space, small country, you know, where are we going to put this stuff? Well, as he showed with the Connecticut Yankee pile of spent fuel, this stuff can be put in a pretty compact area. In fact, well, I'm not, I would never advocate this. Um, you could probably fit all of the spent fuel from the United States in dry casks and put it in an area that would be about the size of the mall. So that's, that's the sort of space we're talking about. Or put another way, about the size of a golf course. Oh, there are lots of golf courses in, in South Korea. Um, NIMBY. Um, we, and, and by the way, just to add a little bit more detail, in. Um, in South Korea, uh, they correctly point out that their current storage facility will run out of space sometime probably in the middle of the next decade. What they don't point out is that there's no possible way a pyroprocessing plant could be ready in time to relieve them of the need to build a new storage facility. Moreover, if you do it, put the fuel through twice as opposed to once, you're still creating a lot of fuel. So you're not going to relieve yourself of the need to store this stuff. NIMB. Uh, so there they're saying effectively people will object deeply to having spent fuel in dry casks, basically in inert storage. You saw the picture earlier. But they will welcome with open arms a plant based on a relatively novel technology that exposes this material to 1200 C temperature. That seems a, like a hard sell to me. Uh, third, need to close the fuel cycle for energy independence. Frank alluded to energy sovereignty. Um, and I am, I consider myself a friend of the ROK. I've spent a lot of time working on the North Korea nuclear issue. Um, and so I've spent time talking to Koreans about this, and I certainly respect their interests. There is still some pain from even as long ago as the 1970s when oil was diverted from uh, headed for the ROK to the United States. But uh, while I think that is an important concern, um, uranium resources are abundant, they're widespread, and they're diverse. There's very little likelihood that such a thing could happen. And since the 1970s, uh, even petroleum resources have become um, both more abundant and diverse in their supply. So, I'm not sure that argument works very well. Um, they've argued they need access to advanced technologies. Compared to AI, next generation bio work, information processing, nuclear fuel uh, reprocessing is an old technology. 
um, and frankly a technological cul-de-sac. It doesn't have wider applications. You're not going to revise or revive your economy based on that. And then final, the final argument is, yeah, but you let Japan do it. <laughs> um, I think Frank actually needs to revise one of his charts where he talked about Rikasha costing $20 billion. I think we're up to $30 billion now. The plant's still not open. This is not an example that anyone would want to emulate. Certainly a friend of the ROK would not be, want the ROK to try and do that. So, um, what else do we need to worry about? Well, um, it's pretty clear to me that the DPRK will never agree to a denuclearization agreement that's asymmetrical, that allows the South to do things that the North can't. It's also clear to me, if you do go forward with reprocessing in the South, the North would therefore demand it. Um, and finally, that if the North were allowed to retain a deep, uh, reprocessing capability, that agreement would be virtually worthless. Because at any time they could uh, remove themselves from safeguards and break out of the treaty, as they have, by the way, multiple times already. So it would just be silly to enter into an agreement that would allow the North to continue with reprocessing. So, de facto, by consenting to reprocessing in the South, you're effectively saying we will never solve the North Korea nuclear weapons problem. Now, I have to admit, I'm a pessimist on that problem anyway, and you might regard that as being not a great cost, but you should at least take it into account as you consider what to do. Um, so where does that leave us? Well, the, um, the question that is most often raised at the Belfer Center where I work is, so what? Well, the so what in this case is that in two years, we're going to be facing this problem all over again because the study will be concluded. The ROK, if it continues with its, on its current trajectory, will ask for consent to implement pyroprocessing. Now, I have to admit that the Moon government might take a different view on this problem than the previous government when this, much of this work was uh, initiated, but this will be an important public policy problem in two, two years. 